David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday, May 7th, 2021. Congratulations, we made it. I don't know. To something. Friday. That actually means something again, as we've observed a couple of times in the Biden era. There are actual weekends, and because the president doesn't spend it to rage tweeting, we're very grateful for that. That's very nice. And uh, it makes doing a Friday show that much more of a pleasure. But of course, first, of course, the work part of it comes and uh, what a pleasure it is to do this work quite uh, quite frankly it's a pretty good job thanks everybody i appreciate your making it possible let's see the kegro in the morning radio show is live now that's what bill tells us all the way from portland maine join me kegro x as i officially start broadcasting over my newly installed a bamboo fiber network yeah we're into the bamboo these days it's a big story live radio has never sounded so grassy why not we can give it a try. There's bamboo in everything. Bamboo in the paper, bamboo all over, uh, anything that has bamboo in it. Obviously, I think prima facie evidence that it comes from China and was planted here. There's no other way to do it. Bamboo grows nowhere but China. I think everybody who actually has ever had bamboo grow- growing anywhere near their own property and had any thoughts of either curtailing it or getting rid of it probably knows that uh, that's not all that easy. And I guess then, therefore, that bamboo being in paper is proof of nothing. It certainly doesn't mean it's uh, the provenance of that paper begins in China. But there you go. Let's see. Lots of uh, commentary on that subject, as it turns out. I think we were, I think uh, it was wise to read through that bananas story yesterday everybody was talking about it by yesterday afternoon people were talking about it before then too that's how we found out about it but i think it was the topic of the day let's see uh oh look at this what uh, do you want to learn something about bamboo while we're at it i mean we might as well right uh let's see who's sent us this one uh oh bruce mcfarland is that you okay here we are is that have i got this right we're, oh, I've lost your bamboo comment. Just pointing out, bamboo paper, not automatically more sustainable hmm, than regular paper, but it can be. But I guess you probably would have questions about whether the, uh, I don't know, Chinese forest management and land, soil and land conservation. I don't know. It could be more sustainable. I think here in the United States, bamboo paper is sold as being more, you know, the idea of it being more sustainable. I don't know whether... That's Chinese sourced bamboo or not, but here we go. So in case you're wondering, there is a bambooink.com that uh, explains it to you. Bamboo paper is, of course, tree free and they'll want to tell you sustainable. But I guess uh, uh, there's some questions about, uh, I don't know what, although they won't be answered. I don't know. How could you answer that? I don't expect the questions to be answered here in this pro bamboo paper page, I guess, but Anyway, uh, among the very many benefits uh, that you can cite in in saying that bamboo paper is environmentally friendly, although there is they they do hedge things here. As with any eco friendly claims, there are many variables to consider. Bamboo is an exceptional renewable resource. Responsible plantation and mill management is that what they're doing in China? I don't know. Can allow bamboo to be a sustainable alternative to wood pulp. So there you go. So uh, penalty to anyone in Arizona who used paper produced in a sustainable process, except, I don't know. Uh, We'll see where that whole thing comes out. I think everybody's kind of enjoying the cuckoo bananas sound of the whole thing. But uh, yeah, I don't know if we're getting anywhere in terms of learning about what happened in Arizona. And I guess we'll never, I mean, we know what happened. I I suppose we should start off by saying that. Uh, The answer is Donald Trump lost, Joe Biden won, and there was no detectable election fraud in Maricopa County or for that matter, anywhere in Arizona. And those are the results. What we'll never know is, well, for one thing, what the lunatics think they were looking for. And 
you'll never be able to do anything else with those ballots because they've all been spoiled now because the chain of custody has become so screwed up thanks to cyber ninjas who I keep seeing cited in the newspapers. I would like to offer this suggestion to the reporters and to the editors. They correctly point out that cyber ninjas has no prior elections auditing experience. After this is over, you can also not report that cyber ninjas has election audit experience. This doesn't count because this wasn't an election audit. This was something else. They still have no election experience even after they're done with this thing and you should take note of that. And I guarantee you that that will that point will never be made and never be made correctly. But, well, okay, you can always turn to us and we'll make the point and remind you of it. All right, lots to do, lots to catch up on. Very little of it actually having to do with bamboo today. But as you know, well, uh, plenty of other stories swirling around, some of which are uh, good uses of your time. Others, well, we'll see. Uh, I'm interested in this one uh, circulating this morning. I guess one or, or several possibly of the Capitol riot and insurgency defendants are claiming in court or have instructed their counsel to claim on their behalf in court that it's all... Uh, It's not their fault. None of it is their fault. They were set up, manipulated, and sent to the Capitol, although they won't, so far they haven't said by Donald Trump, though I guess the answer is indirectly by Donald Trump. But they they are claiming, because they can get away with this one, I guess, that they were poisoned by Fox News, and that's why they showed up. This gives them a way, I guess, to blame it on someone else without blaming it on their big hero. I heard you met your big hero, your big hero, uh, Donald Trump. And he is big, as heroes go, I'm saying. Uh, Here's uh, the Huffington Post's Ryan Riley, whose tweets about the subject I saw first this morning. Ryan joined by Josephine Harvey on the byline. Lawyer says Capitol defendant had Fox mania from watching too much Fox News. It's almost as if it's something we should do something about in this country. For roughly six months after he was laid off, and that's part of the problem there too, I guess, Anthony Antonio, and that's another part of the problem. That's your name? Your name is Antonio, your last name. What should we, what, what, what shall we give him as a first name? How about Antonio? Or okay, here in America, Anthony. Anthony, Anthony, Anthony Antonio, Antonio, Antonio. Mixed bag. I don't know. Anthony Antonio (laughs) was in a home where Fox News played constantly, his attorney told the court. That tips me off to something. Like, uh, was in a home where Fox News played constantly, as opposed to played Fox News constantly in his home? Uh, He looks young enough that maybe he was living at home. This is clearly a pair of abusive parents here, I guess. One, naming him Anthony Antonio, and two, subjecting him to Fox News all the time. Let's see what's up before we assume too much more. Although, really, the stories are always letdowns (laughs) compared to what we imagine these lunatics are all about. A Capitol defendant who bought into former President Donald Trump's lies about a stolen election came down with Foxitis and Fox Mania after watching too much Fox News, his attorney told the court on Thursday. Anthony Antonio's attorney, that's a lot of alliteration there, told a D.C. magistrate judge that after Antonio was laid off because of the coronavirus pandemic last year, he spent all his time living in a home with four other individuals who watched a lot of Fox News. Maybe it was a group, a group home in the, you know, non institutional sense, but that might have been a good setting for him, too. Maybe that's where he'll go next. For the next approximate six months, I would have edited that, Fox Television played constantly, lawyer Joseph Hurley said. Look that guy up. I'm curious about that guy. He became hooked with what I call Foxitis or Fox Mania and became interested in the political aspect and started believing what was being fed to him. The political aspect of life in general, I guess he's... I mean, Fox News, the political aspect of Fox News is Fox News. But 
let's see, another capital defendant on the Zoom hearing, Landon Copeland, soon interrupted Hurley. Oh, I heard about Landon Copeland. Oh, okay, this was the big news yesterday, too. Uh, I guess these people are from all over the place, but being represented before the D.C. magistrate judge by by Hurley, or at least by some of the same lawyers. All the proceedings are taking place in D.C. It makes sense. That's where the crime was. But, um, yeah, who was it? Uh, oh, Landon Copeland was all over the news uh, for having disrupted the hearing and cursing and screaming and carrying on like a lunatic. But, of course, he's charged with being a lunatic. So uh, I guess it makes some sense. Landon Copeland soon interrupted Hurley and objected to him disparaging the former president. Copeland continued interrupting the proceeding over the next several hours, and the judge eventually ordered a competency hearing. <laughs> so we'll usually come from that. Although, who knows? Maybe it's strategic. Hurley, whom the Wilmington, Delaware-based news journal described as an attorney known for his bravado and courtroom theatrics, that's the lawyer, said that Antonio believed he was following Trump's orders to march on Washington and that he was taking part in what he saw as a patriotic movement to serve the United States. That's a very common excuse and a good reason to lock them all up, quite honestly. And not just as lunatics, uh, you know, uh, but the insurgents that they are. What can I tell you? They're, they're not actually necessarily crazy in the, I don't know, in the traditional sense, if there's any traditional sense of crazy, uh, for believing when a president of the United States says there's a major threat against the, I mean, that's the, how the whole thing came together. The, the big problem was that we were all pretending that Donald Trump was and should have been considered president of the United States. That was an extraordinarily dangerous thing to do, and I'm sorry we did it. All right. The lawyer also told the judge that he's in no huge rush to move forward with the case because he wanted prosecutors to take care of bad capital defendants before his client's case was resolved. I, I think he's probably one of the bad ones if he's already on trial at this point. Antonio surrendered to police in Delaware last month. He was charged with five federal crimes linked to his presence at the January 6th riot, knowingly entering or remaining on restricted grounds without lawful authority. It's a long charge. Violent entry and disorderly conduct, impeding law enforcement during civil disorder, disrupting Congress and damaging government property. Those are some interesting charges. I like the impeding law enforcement during civil disorder. Like, can you charge uh, uh, Kate from Animal House with that, you think? Uh, the officer, they're looting the food king. Were they looting the food king? I don't really know whether that was just a diversion or... She was actually just a good Samaritan. Well, we'll uh, debate that for an hour on the second half of the show. In several videos, he was seen among the mob at the Lower West Terrace entrance of the Capitol building, which, quote, saw a tremendous amount of violent criminal activity that day, according to an FBI affidavit. In one video captured on a police body-worn camera, oh, they were working, that's good, Antonio shouted at officers, you want war? We got war. 1776 all over again. And don't forget that that's what Lauren Boebert was tweeting all day long, too, that it was 1776. Uh, when are they going to arrest her? I don't know. He wore a black tactical bulletproof vest adorned with a far right three percenter patch, which means he's a three percenter, a camouflage shirt and had a tattoo of the words Carpe Diem, on his right wrist, the affidavit said. I don't know that that's incriminating, but uh, okay. I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you could make anything out of carpe diem, but I mean, it's a pretty common phrase and a pretty common tattoo also. And I guess it depends like what is accompanying it. You know, if it goes along with a Molon Labe tattoo, maybe. But I have a feeling that carpe diem might be, you know, tattooed across the small of a lot of people's backs as well. So, you know, I'm not entirely sure that that's an incriminating tattoo. But it's also pretty lame, so don't get I don't know. I hope none of you have carpe diem tattoos. But if you do, it's not incriminating. It's just, hey, you were young. I don't know. He's young still, I think. Antonio is accused of climbing the scaffolding outside the Capitol. He's carpeing the... Uh, the scaffolding more so than the diem itself 
and entering the building through a broken window. It was broken when I got here, honest. Obtaining a riot shield and gas mask. I like that too, obtaining it. Like, I ordered it from Amazon? No. I punched a cop and took it. Threatening police and squirting water, we hope, at Michael Fanon. Fanon, Fanoni, I'm not sure how he pronounces his last name. He is the police officer who was dragged down the stairs by rioters and repeatedly tased and beaten. I think he's the one who's been uh, seen on video lately uh, basically discussing how he feels insulted and abandoned by members of Congress, Republican members of Congress, who downplay the events of the day so that they don't get them hung around their necks and uh, how rude and disrespectful and dangerous that all is. But I'm not certain that that was him, but I think I've seen his name before. Uh, but whoever the officer is who made those comments, uh, excellent point, well taken. Multiple men have been arrested in connection with that assault, the dragging of Michael Fanon down these stairs, including Thomas Sibick, Kyle Young, uh, really, this is the person's name, Albuquerque C, the middle initial C, Head, and Daniel Rodriguez, all otherwise normal sounding names. I, I think Dan, Thomas Sibick, Kyle Young, Daniel Rodriguez and Albuquerque C. Head. And that's just weird. Like, is the C for Coke by any chance? Albuquerque Coke Head? Uh, I don't know. That's his name? Albuquerque. Huh. All right. Uh, I don't know. We, there was a congressman recently, a Republican congressman in Virginia, who was defeated in his reelection bid recently because he, uh, uh, what was it? He presided over a same sex marriage. And his name was Denver Riggleman. And that's a city, right? But Albuquerque Riggleman was just too ridiculous, I guess. I don't know. You tell me. Ha. Huh. Well, I'm going to look that guy up. Anyway, they were all charged. Uh, Daniel Rodriguez, uh, I guess, anyway, was charged after a HuffPost investigation identified him as the rioter who electroshocked Fanon. And here he is. Uh, the officer uh, appears in a photograph underneath. Eh, it doesn't tell me anything about how to pronounce his name. So... In an interview with federal authorities in February, Antonio said he locked eyes with Fanon, who begged for help. He said he could see death in the man's eyes and would not be able to get the image of the officer out of his head. I guess it suddenly struck Antonio. I might be the baddie here. Oh, well. Fox News and the Trump administration had a symbiotic relationship for much of Donald Trump's presidency. Uh, and I would say, duh, also his campaign. And that's why he's, you know, he was taken to be president. Though uh, this grew more dangerous and intense in the lead up to and aftermath of the 2020 election. Arguably true. The network amplified Trump's fiction about a rigged election and vice versa. Trump's allies were allowed to broadcast their baseless claims largely unchecked during repeated appearances on air to Fox's millions of viewers. And even after hundreds of pro-Trump rioters inspired by the lie laid siege to the Capitol, some hosts of the network downplayed what happened, spread conspiracy theories about it, and defended the insurrectionists. Yes, and they should be rounded up. But what can you do? Freedom of the press or whatever. Um... But yes, uh, we read not that long ago um, the comments of, I believe, what, former Prime Minister of Australia uh, saying, yeah, uh, Fox News and in particular the Murdoch family ownership of Fox News and their Sky News network and their entire network is a danger to democracy internationally and something ought to be done about it. And I guess we ought to Pay some more attention to that. The Australians leading the way on that. Fanon said in an interview last month that it's been difficult. Ah, it was the right guy. Hearing politicians whitewash the brutal, savage, hand-to-hand -hand combat that he lived through, specifically quoting from an interview Trump gave on Fox News, what do you know, in March, in which the former president claimed rioters posed, quote, zero threat, and where you remember this, quote, hugging and kissing police, which... You know, it's very interesting that he would even bring that up. I mean, for one thing, hardly anybody just, you know, hugs and kisses police, certainly not in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, I guess on top of it all, uh, when Trump discusses hugging and kissing somebody, it's usually against their will and is essentially a sexual assault. 
And these guys are already in the dock for assault. So it's no help whatsoever to have Trump as a character witness saying you were just hugging and kissing people. You don't even wait. You grab them by the stun gun and hug and kiss. And, you know, when you're a star or the fan of a star, they let you do it. Anyway, someone should probably make that point. He's not really helping helping anybody when he says uh, that his supporters were hugging and kissing them. That's what, what an idiot. Okay, I feel bad about that one. And let's see, what else have we got here to add to the mix today? Um, well, this was an interesting uh, profile offered up by Greg Sargent of Elise Stefanik, who appears to be ready to step into the role now being, I guess, abandoned. They'll have a vote and everything. But uh, Liz Cheney no longer apparently interested in the effort it would take to defend her post as GOP conference chair. And we mentioned briefly that Stefanik is kind of a weird fit. Although I did, I said yesterday, well, you know, it's just weird to see her stepping into this role. She's been in Congress for all of 15 minutes. She's not brand new. And I looked her up and uh, she, I guess, won election to Congress for the first time in 2014. She's actually kind of been there a while, three terms, six years. It's not that long. Um, and it's a little early to move into leadership in, I would say, in the Democratic caucus. But, you know, lower rungs of leadership after three terms, it, it's certainly possible. Um, Democratic caucus chair, probably not the case. GOP conference chair, well, it's happening now. But not only is that happening, but as it as it happens, I would point out that though Liz Cheney comes from a political family and her name is well known and yada yada and being from Wyoming her you know prior to this situation her political base was probably pretty solid so there wasn't likely to be much challenge to her remaining in congress that made her a good candidate for leadership cuz you know she would be coming from a stable seat and again the, the name recognition is what did it but Cheney wasn't elected to congress until the 2016 elections so actually been there less time than Stefanik. So this is actually an upgrade in terms of experience, but neither one of them have what I would call the uh, experience necessary to step into a leadership position like that in a, in a more diverse caucus like the Democratic caucus. It would take much greater leadership skills established over a much longer period of time. Uh, they're much more ideological in their in the way they make their choices for leadership than Democrats are um, not necessarily a good or bad thing and a lot of people on the progressive side actually hope for more ideological leadership meetings uh, in the Democratic caucus uh, you know I, I don't think that they would agree to say well we want it done the same way that the Republicans do they're hoping certainly for a different ideology but we're more money driven than they are but okay so here comes Stefanik, um, and I'm not certain. I'm not certain how she got herself into this position. I guess she was just playing off of her strenuous and somewhat crazy defense of Trump during the first impeachment. She really made a name for herself there, and I guess that's what she's playing on. Because as Greg mentioned when we spoke about it yesterday, she's ideologically not even close to or what would ordinarily be considered conservative enough to, to get this job. She'd almost be considered a moderate, which is sad and telling because of how, you know, what a fringe loony she turned into during the uh, impeachment. But So here's what Greg Sargent has to say about her. Elise Stefanik is a perfect leader of today's GOP. Her own statements show why. So let's read some of those statements. Again, it's Greg Sargent's piece in The Plumb Line. With Republicans preparing to oust Liz Cheney of Wyoming from the House GOP leadership and replace her with Elise Stefanik of New York, whose uh, own political base is much less stable. She may even find, if she ascends to this leadership position as uh, New York redistricts post-2020 census and uh, redistricts under Democratic direction, they may actually try and focus on perhaps eliminating her seat entirely. We'll see whether or not that ends up being the case. Anyway, 
As uh, Cheney ends up replaced with Stefanik, reporters have been digging up past Stefanik statements, displaying her true credentials as a Republican leader of the future. Those credentials most obviously are her unwavering loyalty to Donald Trump and to his big lie about the stolen 2020 election, but another crucial credential, one getting less attention, and that's what Greg's article, I guess, is for, is Stefanik's willingness to deceive her own constituents to justify taking official action to eliminate or to invalidate legitimate election results. Hmm. Just before voting to object to President Biden's electors on January 6th, Stefanik released a lengthy statement faithfully echoing numerous Trumpian lies about the election, including or included flatly debunked nonsense about 140,000 unauthorized votes in Georgia. This showed Stefanik embracing Trump and his lies more directly than other Republicans, many other Republicans, who carefully couched votes against Biden electors as being procedural objections. As Josh Marshall notes, this is a big reason Stefanik is a rising GOP star. But what came next is also important. A few days after the insurrectionist mob attack on the Capitol, Stefanik came under fire for feeding the lies that incited the violence. She defended herself to a local news outlet. President Biden, President-elect Biden was certified, Stefanik told WCAX, but that debate was important for the American people to hear. In other words, Stefanik said she did the right thing in objecting to Biden's electors because it drew attention to problems with the election that Americans deserved to learn about. Those problems didn't actually exist, of course, but Stefanik herself also amplified them. So she seems perfectly cut out for leadership in the new Republican Party. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's continue on with uh, what Greg Sargent has to say here about uh, Lise Stefanik and what it might be like having her replace uh, Liz Cheney at the head of the Republican conference in the House. Uh, where were we? Uh, when we left off, I think we had just said, uh, oh, yes, right. So uh, Stefanik, I guess, did more than many rank-and-file Republicans inside the House conference by uh, uh, pointedly saying that uh, this whole objection and the vote she cast in opposition to certifying Biden's electoral vote victory were based on, of course, uh, they drew problems, uh, they drew attention to problems that Americans deserved to learn about, even though they didn't actually exist. So really, it probably wouldn't have been a good idea to learn about them at all. It's important, he continues, to understand that this isn't mere after-the-fact spin. Rather, it's an explicit declaration of liberation on the part of the speaker to, not the House speaker, but the person who's speaking here, Stefanik, to deceive voters with falsehoods about legitimate election results for the purpose of justifying official action to overturn those results. And I guess now everybody, at this point, many eyes are just turning to uh, the next election, whether presidential or the midterm elections, and just saying, obviously going to be Republican policy everywhere to simply say an election that Republicans lose is a on is, is illegitimate on its face and we will simply refuse to certify those results. And in states where Republican legislators considered invalidating results but found that the law stood in their way, in those states where those Republicans dominate the state legislatures or perhaps even have the governor's office, they have been hard at work at repealing 
And they were never able to repeal and replace Obamacare, but they are finding their way toward repealing and replacing the laws that forbade them from simply rejecting and reversing the election results at their whim. So, uh, yeah, it's a pretty major uh, problem that we're facing. And a lot of other articles make mention of the same worry. Let's uh, see what else that uh, he has to offer here. The the pro-Trump sweet spot is the next section here. Similarly, just after the violence at the Capitol, Stefanik explained her vote against Biden electors. On the House floor, she again echoed the same widely debunked claims, insisting that, quote, tens of millions of Americans are concerned about them and deserved to hear them debated. This sort of phony piety is the sweet spot for Republicans who want to stand out from their colleagues in terms of appealing to the Trumpist base and getting plaudits from pro-Trump media while retaining a veneer of respectability in the process. This continues today. The claim of these Republicans is that, in objecting to Biden electors, they were merely creating an outlet for people's concerns about the elections. How heroically public-spirited of them. Senator Josh Hawley, uh, for instance, is one of the slimiest practitioners of this disingenuous game and has repeatedly defended his lead role in undermining Biden electors by claiming he was merely representing his constituents' worries about the election's dubious outcome. Of course, the concerns are entirely basis, uh, baseless, and people such as Stefanik and Hawley themselves fed those concerns relentlessly. Foxitis. It's absurd to portray this as an act of public-spirited representation of constituents. Instead, these officials use their official stature to actively deceive them. Nor do Republicans seeking this sweet spot admit that the lies about the election, which they themselves fed, inspired the insurrection. In an interview with WWNY, Stefanik condemned the violence but declined to blame Trump for it, insisting he had not encouraged it. Stefanik endorses uh, also the Arizona recount, which isn't a recount, of course, but, uh, well, that's the word that unfortunately gets used here. It says, uh, afterwards, it gets worse. Stefanik just endorsed a GQP, I would say, recount underway of votes in Arizona. This recount, which isn't a recount, is being conducted by people who have already spread lies about the election, which means it is designed to create more fake fodder to undermine confidence in the 2020 outcome. In fact, I would say that the people conducting or the people in charge of conducting this fake audit are running the same game as Stefanik. That is, they say that they're merely you know, that they're open to any outcome and that they're merely addressing people's concerns. They they actually, uh, when the higher-ups speak about it, they say, you know, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. We're simply saying lots of people have questions about the fairness of the count in, uh, the fairness of the vote and the fairness of the count in Maricopa County. And we want to lay that to rest. If we find that there was no fraud, well, then good. Then people will stop complaining about the fraud. Well, I don't think so. But, you know, uh, the point is that they're, again, selling themselves as, well, we're just answering questions that people have. Of course, people have those questions because you've been saying that the outcome of the vote and the count was wrong. And who better to prove it than me myself? So uh, that's how they ended up getting the job. It's bad that Stefanik's fealty to Trump and his lies uh, is among the things qualifying her to replace Cheney. But it's perhaps more alarming that Stefanik is seen as so qualified, despite or perhaps because of her willingness to deceive countless voters about legitimate election results to manufacture justification for action to overturn them. It's often said that GOP voters believe the election was stolen from them. But there's a reason for this. Their elites relentlessly told them so. They had a fire hose of falsehoods blasted into their brains for months on end, as Sean Illing memorably notes. That's interesting. We should probably uh, check that citation out. That's from uh, Vox, where Sean Illing's piece is titled, 
The fantasy industrial complex gave us the Capitol Hill insurrection. Perhaps we should look into this and make the theme Foxitis and Fox mania. Considering that it's, what's amazing is it's the cause of the insurrection and at the same time being offered as defense against prosecution for the insurrection, which I guess is an interesting parallel to the dual role that these lies played for people like Stefanik and others in Republican leadership, Trump included, where you say that the election's been stolen, then people hear you and believe that the election has been stolen, and then you say, well, see, that person has questions about the election. I simply want to answer them. Uh, same thing, I guess, happening for the victims of Foxitis. They are... Uh, consuming that nonsense and acting on it, saying, I'm merely, you know, I'm merely attempting to overthrow the government because so many people have questions about the integrity of the election. Well, where are you, where are they getting that, those questions? They're getting it from Fox. And I know that is true because I got it from Fox. And if anyone's to blame here, it's really Fox and not me, the person with the uh, stun gun and stick and bear spray in my hands. But yeah, the same thing happening here uh, <clears throat> and in F Vox's retelling of what's been happening on Fox. Hmm. It's Vox versus Fox. What a morning. Worse, Greg Sargent continues, those elites, the Republican ones, have cited those same public beliefs to justify taking action to invalidate legitimate results. And since then, they've kept telling their voters that their right to suspect something was amiss about the outcome to justify voter suppression later across the country in upcoming elections. All this official misconduct further undermines democratic stability. As Laura Field says, such deception has very high stakes because it undercuts citizens' rational faculties and creates distrust that destroys the very possibility of liberal democracy. I mean, I guess I also, I, in adding to this, <clears throat> if you, this is, this is one of the problems that it creates for Democrats and others who might be considered normal people. Uh, you know, for certain subjects, we are constantly reminded by level-headed folks like Greg that uh, admonishing people that have these weird beliefs and arguing with them or shaming them and pointing fingers at them might not work in some cases. I mean, in some cases, nothing will work, but it might not work as well as perhaps engaging them and finding leaders that they trust to help you diffuse the situation, as the case may be with, say, vaccine hesitancy. But I don't know that the same applies, and I don't know if Greg would agree with it or not, but the same may not apply. Um, although, you know, these people, if you're talking about uh, people who, quote unquote, have questions about the integrity of the election, some of them may be irretrievable, I guess. But uh, if you engage with them patiently and say, all right. <clears throat> now, I happen to think personally that you're entirely crazy for believing this. You wouldn't tell them this, but you say, all right, you say you have questions. Well, I will take you at your word and we'll address those questions. And very shortly, you will see that there's zero proof for your questions and a universe of proof that would convince an ordinary logical person that your questions are baseless and you ought to abandon them. But, uh, well, one, if you demonstrate that their worldview is baseless, you know, they'll they'll say you've been attacking them and and they won't be persuaded by attacks. You made me a Nazi. You made me a lunatic by showing me I was wrong about all of my anti-Semitism or uh, lunatic conspiracy theories. You pushed me into it. But uh, in many cases, I think engaging these views from a traditional standpoint, ends up legitimizing them. It, you know, not only are they able, and not only are they stuck in this feedback loop that enables them to say, well, I just have questions, and I have questions because the leaders who benefit from my having questions are telling me I should have questions. And then when I say, I agree, I will have questions, they say, I'm just, you know, acting on their questions. I told them to have these questions, 
now they have them and I will do what I will with them. But in addition, uh, you know, one of the real problems here is that they say, well, if my questions weren't legitimate, well, then what is this well-dressed, well-groomed, centrist person doing engaging sensibly with me and debating my questions with me? If I were a lunatic, they would just send somebody with a white coat and throw a net over me, and then I would know for sure that I was a lunatic and were wrong. Except then, you know, if you actually go and do that, then they say, you're making me a Nazi by ostracizing me from society. So there's really no winning with these guys. So, that you know, the answer becomes, you know, in a liberal democracy, there's no, there's no answer in a liberal democracy about what to do with them. You throw them off a cliff is what you should do with them. But, I mean, you can't because we're dedicated to principles of not throwing people off cliffs in this country. I think that's actually in the Constitution. And it is in so many words, you know. But uh, there's, d d right, well, you know, we've been over this subject. Let's find bipartisan compromise with them. Well, you can't, obviously. There's just nothing to do with that. How do you find bi bipartisan compromise with a yes or no question? Is Joe Biden president of the United States? Let's find bi in bipartisan compromise. He's only half the president. You know, what do you do? There's no there's no compromise position to take. So if you if you do attempt to find middle ground with them, they take the attempt at finding middle ground with them as evidence that their position is worthy of trying to take middle ground with. So, you know. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. So you might as well do throw them off a cliff, but but don't do it. You know, just, I don't want I don't want anybody saying that I told you to throw them off a cliff because I didn't. All right, let's go back to Greg Sargent because he's not going to tell you to throw anybody off a cliff. I've argued, he says, that the real problem with the Cheney situation isn't just that Republicans are punishing her for denouncing Trump and the big lie. It's also that they're excommunicating Cheney amid her demand that Republicans fully commit to respecting Democratic outcomes going forward. That is true and a problem. That Republicans are punishing this, of all things, suggests they might be pushing us toward an eventual breakdown. The elevation of Stefanik, who's among the most determined in the House GOP caucus when it comes to deceiving voters about the legitimacy of our electoral system, should only fuel those fears. Well, they do. I'm afeard of it greatly myself just now, and uh, you ought to be too. I mean, essentially, what have we learned here? That if a situation were to arise in 2022 or 24, wherein uh, Republicans were to lose the election, let's use 2024 as the example here because it's a cleaner example to use when there's one election we can all focus on, the presidential election, which is maybe a problem with our system in general, but okay. Uh, let's say it happens again, and Stefanik uh, has reason to believe that there are that, that Republican claims of massive voter fraud this time aren't true. Let's just say, as a as a hypothetical, uh, I think she knows at this point that if she knows the truth to be that there was no voter fraud involved, that if she takes that position. She will. What will happen to her? Just what happened to Cheney. She'll get bounced in favor of somebody else, whether there is somebody qualified for the position or not. And so in order to maintain her position of leadership, she's going to have to claim that there was massive voter fraud, even if she doesn't believe that that's the case. The path to leadership in the Republican Party now is you absolutely positively must endorse the idea that there was massive voter fraud and that there and you'll have to do it again regardless of the situation regardless of the outcome i suppose well maybe not regardless of the outcome if republicans manage to manufacture a situation in which it's said that they have won the election then they'll say everything went well and the uh, elections were um, uh, properly conducted which also, that, by the way, sets up a very scary situation of, uh, in its own right. So it's scary that if Republicans were to lose, they would simply declare themselves the winner and that they would hold political power in some states, enough states perhaps, that they uh, gave themselves to declare themselves the winner. 
using their uh, existing majorities to simply make that a rule, make that law. Uh, but not only that, but if the, I, here's here's a scenario. OK, given what's going on and what Republicans are obviously willing to say and what Democrats aren't. What would you do heading into an election that you, you know, you, everything rides on Republicans performing well in the next election, whether again, whether 2022 or 2024 or both. Uh, so how far out of your way would you go to, uh, quote unquote, let's say, guarantee that you had a head start in this thing coming out of it by with a win at the polls? What what shenanigans would you be willing to pull and what shenanigans would you avoid, given that if the Republicans were to cheat their ever loving asses off in broad daylight in ways that were so foolish that no one could miss their uh, their their cheating? It's obvious on its face. Well, what do Democrats do at that point? Of course, you know, the first inclination would be, you know, what? To say, hey, this isn't right. They're cheating. We have definitive proof of their cheating. At which point Republicans would say, oh, this, okay, sure. I, when we said it, we were crazy, right? But now when Democrats say it, they're very sensible, right? And wouldn't you know it? The political press may very well just say, oh, yeah. Both sides, whenever they lose, now everybody, whoever loses, claims voter fraud. And I don't know how much defense would you think would be put up in the traditional media uh, where reporters would be willing to say, it's true that they mouthed the same words, but there was no evidence of fraud when Republicans were claiming there was massive fraud. And here, Democrats have actually produced Proof. Like, let's say that they, I mean, I don't know. They may very well just fabricate evidence for all I know. I guess anything's possible. But, you know, so far to date, they haven't done it that I can see. But uh, although some people might point to claims made after the 2004 presidential election or even the 2000 presidential election that uh, that the claims of, of difficulties or problems that arose in the vote count, which I think are obvious on their face in 2000, were actually just fraudulent. I mean, they dismissed, you remember how they dismissed it in 2000, sore loser men. Yeah, and the, and the Brooks Brothers riot. It's very, it's actually very worrisome that uh, the, the outcome of all of their complaints and the crazier they are in their complaints, you might sometimes wonder, don't they get embarrassed at, uh, at perpetuating this lie when they are frequently called out as being liars? And the answer is perhaps, well, one, it doesn't matter to me because I just got elected Republican conference chair in the House. Or two, well, it serves us well in elections coming up. When we do our uh, run our voter suppression plans and cheat in the election as we plan to do and inevitably fumble on that cheating and get caught red handed, we need to be able to say, oh, really? This Oh, so now you're saying that there was massive election fraud, but it's totally legit. Whereas when we said it, it was crazy. And I think that why that's so crazy, it just might work. And that always worries me. Okay, well, there you have it. That's a pretty interesting uh, 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 extraction. It's not in Greg Sargent's piece, but I guess uh, you can say you heard it here first. If If anybody ever says... That's actually a good thought. Where did you hear it? Then tell them. If they say that's crazy, then um, let's say that uh, let's say that uh, Greg told them that that was well, not Greg uh, Sargent. He'll he'll argue. With it. We'll say Greg Dworkin did it, and uh, maybe he'll never find out about it. Okay, so pin it on him. That's the big plan. All right. Let's see what other things do I want to share with you. There's a couple of tangential stories out there of some interest, but uh, let's take a stop on this one. We almost forgot about these lunatics as they're rounding up all the other weirdo lunatics for the insurrection. I'm wondering why there weren't more of these folks at the event. How did they get themselves excluded? And it might be just that they're so extreme and weird that even the people extreme and weird enough to have participated in the Capitol riot don't want anything to do with them. But 
Remember the Boogaloo Boys? You would think that in an effort to overthrow the United States government by right-wingers, Fox News watchers, Trump lunatics, etc., that there would be there would have been more Boogaloo Boys present, given that their entire reason for being appears to be overthrowing the United States in a violent insurrection. Well, uh, they're sort of rele relegated to the second and third tier of news about extremists in this country, even though you get headlines like this one from where? KSTP.com, uh, Channel 5, Eyewitness News, an ABC affiliate in where? Uh, Minneapolis, I guess. That's the weather they're displaying up at the top. So second member of Boogaloo Boys pleads guilty to conspiracy, pretty bad, right? To provide material support to Hamas. Hamas? What? <clears throat> what? What? How could there be? A, what relationship should there ever be? Well, between anybody and Hamas, but Boogaloo Boys and Hamas, they're, they're so, so eager to overthrow the United States government that they are not accepting help from Hamas, which is, I guess, what I would have thought if you told me, I want you to cook up a theory wherein the Boogaloo Boys are connected with Hamas, I would say. Hamas, interested in striking a blow against the United States government, finds a domestic insurrectionist sect and provides them with material support. What the Boogaloo Boys are doing, exporting uh, material support to Hamas, I have no idea. Unless in pursuit of a coordinated attack on American soil aimed at overthrowing the United States government. Let's find out. A Minnesota man who has ties to the Boogaloo Boys a loosely connected group of individuals who espouse violent anti-gun uh, government sentiments, plead, uh, pleaded guilty to conspiracy to provide materials to support Hamas. I, I would have thought, I don't know whether that's different from providing material support to, but actual materials in support of Hamas. Oh, let's find out. Maybe it's just a weird phrasing. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, Michael Solomon, 31 years old, of New Brighton, pleaded guilty to conspiracy to provide, conspiracy to provide, material support, there we are, same thing, to what he believed was Hamas, a designated foreign terrorist organization, for use against Israeli and U.S. military personnel overseas. So I guess we see motivation here. Well, I'm anti-government, so I want to hit at their installations overseas. But I guess I'd also say, all right, I'm putting my head and myself in the shoes of the Boogaloo boys here. I would say uh, as far as uh, Hamas's pursuit of strikes against American personnel overseas go versus our record of strikes against American government personnel here at home, I would say Hamas in the lead on that one. And probably more, I would have thought, traditionally in the position of providing support to others but I don't know. But I. But then again, Hamas wasn't actually asking for help here. It was a setup. It was the FBI saying, hi, I'm from Hamas. Will you help me? And I don't think that anybody, I don't know. I wonder whether any of them thought that that plan was going to work. I mean, I don't see how you would propose it and get it approved in the FBI if you didn't think it was going to work. And it did. So I guess they're right. So what it tells you is Boogaloo boys are extraordinarily stupid and over eager to cause problems for anybody that they can. And I guess FBI agents probably know that and are a little smarter about the Boogaloo Boys than I would have guessed. I'm glad that they know at least how dumb some of them are. Let's hope they know uh, more about them and can round them all up before they're able to do anything. So, okay, Michael Solomon gets himself in trouble because he thinks he's talking to Hamas about helping them with something that they would use in a strike against both U.S. and Israeli military personnel overseas. According to court documents in late May of 2020, the FBI initiated an investigation into Solomon and co-defendant Benjamin Ryan Teeter, who, uh, two members of the Boogaloo Boys and a subgroup called the Bujahideen, which will tell you about where their heads are. Court documents say in 2020, and I would have said, oh, that's just a joke. But then I suppose they were eager to help Hamas, so maybe it's not just a joke. I don't know. 
Court documents say that in June of that year, 2020, Solomon and Teeter met with a confidential source who they believed was a member of Hamas. During those meetings, Solomon and Teeter discussed providing assistance to Hamas as a means to fur of furthering the goals of the Boogaloo Boys, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office. During one meeting in June, Solomon and Teeter met with an undercover FBI agent they believed was a member of Hamas and proposed manufacturing suppressors, untraceable firearms, and fully automatic firearms for Hamas. All right. Now a plan to do something that makes some sense to me takes shape. That is to say, I don't think it makes very much sense to produce those things for Hamas, but it makes sense. Why would the Boogaloo Boys be interested in helping Hamas? And the answer probably is, well, we're really not, but we'll get some money and we get to play with guns and build ghost guns for somebody here and they're going to pay us. The fact that it's Hamas troubles me not at all because I don't like the United States government and I guess now it's starting to make some sense. Uh, on June 30th, they delivered five suppressors, a grand total of five suppressors, silencers, essentially, to the confidential source they believed to be a member of Hamas and expressed their desire, uh, despite the fact that they were selling suppressors, the desire was expressed. They expressed their desire to manufacture more suppressors. They enjoyed doing it. And fully automatic weapons for Hamas. That sounds like a fun afternoon for Boogaloo boys. The attorney's office said Solomon and Teeter believed the suppressors and a part designed for use in converting a weapon to shoot automatically, known as a drop-in auto-seer, would be used by Hamas to attack Israeli and U.S. soldiers. How exciting. Solomon admitted that he and Teeter again met an undercover FBI agent on August 29th. During that meeting, the defendants gave the undercover agent a 3D printed device that could be used to convert semi-automatic rifles. We'll be back. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I think that really sums it up for the article on the Boogaloo Boys. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess this was just them playing with the toys they liked most. They love making those ghost guns. They love making the suppressors because they're not supposed to. And really, they wanted to make them for themselves. And they probably thought, test run, we'll learn how to make them and make them for these guys and they'll pay us. And who cares if they're from Hamas? Uh and they probably only had to tell them that they were from Hamas because they uh, they might have asked questions. Or maybe, probably the FBI guys thought they would either be asked or they had to be ready to give a cover story as to why they wanted to buy these guns lest the Boogaloo boys come to suspect that they might be FBI agents in disguise. So they said, well, I don't know, uh, we're from Hamas. Uh, we need silencers. Like, when has Hamas been like, we need silencers to to attack Israeli military personnel. I, I think they would want that to be as loud as possible, but whatever. It was cool and tactical sounding and uh, was all the Boogaloo boys needed to hear to believe that there was somebody who genuinely wanted to purchase these things. So they did it. Plus, they got to play with their 3D printer and make these, I guess this they must have 3D printed this drop-in auto seer, which I'm not terribly familiar with. <clears throat> that would supposedly convert semi-automatic rifles into fully automatic mode. But, eh, okay, so great. They got to play around with that. That uh, put them at odds with the United States government. Bump stocks, not enough for them to uh, play with. They wanted to have an actual full auto thing because they love weaponry and weapons gadgets. And uh, so it was just a chance for them to play with these things. Solomon pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy to provide material support to a designated foreign terrorist organization and now faces a penalty of maximum of 20 years in prison. So whatever. We'll see how that goes and who he blames for his uh, misguided youth in uh, uh, sentencing phase. We'll see whether it's Fox News or, or someone else. Okay, moving on to some other topics, and there are many. We could try and put together a theme here, uh, a mini theme, an interlude, if you will. I happen to have seen this morning that uh, one of our Twitter pals has offered us a story that I actually didn't, uh, I don't think I knew anything about here, although I've been seeing weird stories that are similar for some time, are... Twitter friend, that guy, who's 
He, yeah, he doesn't want to be that guy, but he is that guy. That guy, 3002, or 3002, is the Twitter handle, in case you haven't been following along. And his tip here is, uh, the the uh, the message he sent me is uh, a, a back-channel direct message on, on Twitter. So super secret. Don't tell anyone. That whack job Miami private school that is firing teachers that get the vaccine. I don't think I've heard this story, but I guess I should have by now because, it's, uh, well, that's how it sounds when I'm reading this. But anyway, did you know that there was one? There is. A Miami whack job private school firing teachers who get the vaccine is looking for an executive assistant for the whack job CEO. The tasks in the job description mention the word confidential Three times, which is apparently an inordinate number of times for a an executive assistant to a CEO of a private school. But they're in a very intensely private school. It's not that you have to pay for it with private funds. It's just we're just very attentive to privacy in the upper echelons of management here at this school. Interesting. So Sentner Academy, I guess, is the name of the school. So if you were wondering where what whack job private school in Miami is firing people, well, according to that guy... Over there, it's the Sentinel Academy. And I guess we could Google them and see if they're in the news. Uh, is it an overly long job description? I don't think so. But, I mean, whatever. I don't know. I, I won't read it. I'll take his word for it that uh, confidential is, mitten, is in here a couple of times, maybe more than it should be. But uh, it otherwise appears to be a relatively straightforward job description. It's just that they're obsessed with their confidentiality and i guess uh they would be especially if they were engaged in a probably illegal program to fire teachers who actually get the vaccine let's see what uh what they're all about are they in the news we'll just copy and paste it and open up a new tab here and see what we got when it comes to sentinel academy and click on the news tab sentinel academy controversy education secretary says schools should follow the science not be Threatening teachers. That's uh, the report of CBS in Miami, Channel Four. Uh, let me see what the other any any more uh, any clearer headlines. New York Times headline on how the Sentner Academy became a beacon for anti-vaxxers. That seems to be right on point. Interesting. Well, I mean. What's the story there? Let's, uh, let's grab it quick. Sentinel Academy barred teachers newly vaccinated against the coronavirus from being near students. Some parents threatened to withdraw their children. Others clamored to enroll. I guess that's a niche. Uh, there is a weird subsection of anti-vaxxers, subsegment of the anti-vaxxers, who believe that the vaccine is dangerous not only because something, something, blah, 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 that it will do to the person who receives the vaccine, but that it enables or uh, whatever. It enables the, the people who have been vaccinated to shed that terrible problem off on others who haven't been vaccinated. And I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there is a variety of claims. But well, here's what's interesting. How do you protect yourself from being infected with the bad stuff that they believe the vaccine produces in the vaccinated? I'm just curious, like, is there a vaccine against the vaccine? Is that essentially where you would end up? But but then, of course, your head explodes because you're anti-vax, and I don't know. Uh, it may be that they just are weird, and uh, that would be a good excuse for them to live as separatists, I suppose, or in underground bunkers. So that might be a self-fulfilling prophecy all by itself. Speaking of, by the way, heads exploding, and one of my earlier uh, worries about future conspiracy theories by Republicans, where I said... Uh, you remember I mentioned uh, what it's like, it seems like a year ago now that I mentioned that maybe Republicans, uh, if Democrats were to uh, suffer at the hands of voter fraud and suppression, both probably at the in, in the next elections and Republicans were to prevail and there was genuine evidence of that election tampering by Republicans and Democrats brought it up, Republicans would say, oh, see, who's crazy now? That sort of play. Uh, I wonder, I was just thinking in terms of heads exploding. What if, uh, though she's no longer contesting the post, 
Liz Cheney were to say, well, you know the process. Let's have a vote. I don't mind having a vote. I, I expect to lose, but let's just have the vote and see how it goes. Uh, just for fun, since Liz Cheney is apparently, uh, I guess, considering, had considered Brian Monroe's idea, it seemed, to at least, if not introduce a resolution of censure against Donald Trump using the words of um, of of uh, Kevin McCarthy from the immediate aftermath of the January 6th insurrection saying that Trump was responsible. It was Brian Monroe, I think, carrying uh, Benji Sarlin's suggestion and, and giving it his thumbs up. So the thumbs up from Canada. He represents all of Canada, in my view. Uh, but the idea being use the fact that Kevin McCarthy, when he was on the hot seat, was, uh, you know, clear about blaming Trump for the insurrection and Trump supporters for the insurrection, bring that forward as a censure resolution. But even if you don't do that, at least remind people, you're throwing me out for being insufficiently loyal to Trump, but you're keeping Kevin McCarthy, who was also insufficiently loyal to Trump, but then just changed his tune. And that's enough for you. You don't want somebody who's been, you know, prince, principled in your view and held the same views the whole time. You just want people who will bend to your view and I'm not willing to do that. Anyway, uh, speaking of heads exploding, suppose, though, that they go ahead with the election and at least Stefanik wins. And Liz Cheney says, I don't think she did win. I allege that there was massive voter fraud in the vote count. <laughs> so what do you do then as a Republican? Do you not simply say, well, I, I, constituents have concerns. We have to have an investigation and have cyber ninjas audit the vote for GQP conference chair. Or do you say, no, 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 no. That's nonsense. That's crazy. There was no fraud. And you know what? They would say that. And you know what? They will say that in 2022 and 2024 as well. Good test case. So as long as we're suggesting things to Liz Cheney and she's trying them out, Try that one out. After you are ousted as GQP conference chair, you should allege voter fraud and see what they say. Just so we all know. All right. Back to Sentner Academy. Uh, let's see. I don't, I'll just take a quick look here. Patricia Matze writing this piece for the New York Times. Uh, it looks to me like, by the way, the picture of the place has, they have armed guards out front, uh, but dressed just like exactly how you would hope not to see armed guards dressed at your kid's school. Tactical pants and uh, vests and maybe long rifles. It's hard to see in this picture whether they've got rifles on them. They may just have handguns on them. But uh, yeah, some tactically dressed uh, school guards. All right. A fifth grade math and science teacher peddled a bogus conspiracy theory on Wednesday to students at Sentner Academy, a private school in Miami, warning them that they should not hug parents who had been vaccinated against the coronavirus for more than five seconds, because if they did, they might be exposed to harmful vaccine shedding. Yikes. Well, this is very recent in the first couple of days of May, published on May 2nd, so just the other day. Hola, mommy, one student wrote in an email to her parents from school saying that the teacher was, quote, telling us to stay away from you guys. At least they can see through the idiocy, I think. Nearly a week before, the school had threatened teachers' employment if they got a coronavirus vaccine before the end of the school year. I don't know what makes the end of the school year uh, special, but alarmed parents frank frantically texted one another on WhatsApp trying to find a way to pull their children out at the end of the term. I mean, just do it. All right, what are you, like, you got a lifetime contract? You're in Sea Org now? All right, just leave. Inside Sentner Academy, however, hundreds of queries from all over the world came in for teaching positions, according to the administration. More came from people who wanted to enroll their children at the school, where tuition runs up to $30,000 a year. The small school in Miami's trendy design district became a national beacon for anti-vaccination activists practically overnight last week, just as public health officials in the United States wrestled with how to overcome vaccine skepticism. The policy barring teachers from contact with students after getting the vaccine, 
there should really not be very much contact with the students anyway, if you're talking about hugging for more than five seconds. Uh, but this brought a flurry of television news crews who parked outside the school for days, prompting teachers to keep children indoors for physical education and recess. Layla, oh, Lila Sentner, the school's founder, that's named after, okay, I see, uh, who says she is not against fully tested vaccines, wrote on Instagram that journalists are, quote, trying to destroy my reputation because I want, I went against their narrative. Uh, sounds like she's been doing her own research on the internet. Devoted supporters cheered her on. We won't let you them take you down, one wrote on Instagram. We stand strong with you. You're an angel. You're an angel. Trying to save our kids and teachers. Oh, boy. Ms. Sentner, an avid social media user who has long used her accounts to document her luxurious lifestyle. A 30 grand a student, I can see where it comes from. Took effective control of the school last year in the midst of the pandemic. She told the community that the school with pre-K through 8th grade would focus on happiness and espouse medical freedom. But interviews with 21 current and former parents and teachers, as well as a review of social media posts and school documents, emails, text messages, and videos, show how the wealthy and well-connected Ms. Sentner brought her anti-vax and anti-masking views into the school's day-to-day -day life, turning what had been a tight-knit community into one bitterly split between those who support her views on vaccinations and those who do not. Every afternoon I have to explain things to my child when she comes home and says, how come the school says what you're saying is not right? Says Iris Acosta Zobel, referring to the importance that she gives at home on to masking and vaccinations. She pulled her daughter out of the school on Friday. See, she found a way. Just do it. David J. Sentner, a former electronic highway tolling entrepreneur. What? Electronic highway tolling entrepreneur whatever, who co-founded the school in its current iteration with his wife, said in written responses to questions that the school was listening to families. We're just reflecting their concerns. You see, we've met with more than 70 parents, pleased that so many families continue to support our mission. Um, it's not clear, like, what is, is our David Sentner? Is his wife Lila Sentner? Or is that his daughter? I'm not sure which. It was weird that they said she wrested control of the school away, I guess, or took control during the pandemic. Sarah Dagan, who has four children at the school, said she was not troubled by the controversy. Everything was blown out of proportion, she said. I'm comfortable with holding off on the vaccine. My main concern is the happiness of the kids. Most people interviewed for this article requested anonymity to protect their children or their employment. Some former parents and teachers said they feared retaliation if they spoke publicly. Others declined to comment because the school had made them sign non-disclosure agreements. The anti-vaccination policy requires recently vaccinated teachers to maintain a distance from students. I mean, I bet they don't have any problem with that. Ms. Sentner told teachers not to hug the children, for example. He caused such a frenzy, too much hugging going on there, that a reporter asked about it during a White House briefing. The school received, by the way, $804,375 from the Federal Paycheck Protection Program during the pandemic. Jen Psaki, the press secretary, who uh, I hear this morning said she's going to uh, leave after a year on the job or something like that. I don't know whether it was the end of this year or, or what. People are rather upset about that, it turns out. Well, she noted that public health guidelines, of course, strongly encourage vaccines against the coronavirus and are meant to keep people safe. Sentner Academy opened in its current form last year. It's long it was established 2020 long-standing member of the community, after the Sentners, who previously owned just the preschool, took over the Metropolitan International School, an established private school that focused on foreign languages and served an international clientele. Its owner retired and said the school would merge with the preschool owned by the Sentners, who have donated heavily in recent years to the Republican Party and former President Donald J. Trump. Imagine rich, wacko conservatives in Florida supporting Trump. By the time the pandemic hit, the school's old identity and leaders were gone and the Sentners were at the helm. And they called it the Sentner School, Sentner Academy. So that's kind of weird. Things began to change, parents said. Surveillance cameras were installed to record both video and audio for what Mr. Sentner said were security and insurance purposes. Might be normal. Mrs. or Ms. Sentner once remarked that children should be kept away from the windows. Why? Well, 
for fear of radiation from 5G cell towers, of course. Another baseless conspiracy theory. The windows at the preschool now have electromagnetic frequency shielding blockers, Mr. Sentner said in response to questions about the school's 5G concerns. Of course, people bring the phones in. You know, who knows what happens. The school opposed feeding children sugar and gluten. Mm, not the worst thing in the world, although, you know, whatever. And required that students have different shoes for indoors and outdoors. Uh, you know, also not terribly, you know, I mean, it's a little obsessive, but, you know, there's a basis for it, as opposed to like, like the 5G thing. Some parents said they thought such ideas were odd, but inoffensive. Unlike what began to happen with the school's response to the coronavirus. The school opened for in-person instruction in September and initially pledged to follow centers for uh, CDC guidelines, essentially, as well as a local mask mandate. But teachers said they found no attempt at social distancing during orientation in August and Ms. Sentner discouraged mask use. Teachers had to sign waivers acknowledging that there was a health risk associated with returning to work in person. When the Florida Department of Health visited for routine food inspections in August and December, teachers were told to mask up, according to a former teacher and a current teacher who produced two WhatsApp messages as proof. Parents were offered forms to exempt their children from any need to wear masks, similar to a school policy that also exempts children from vaccines of all kinds if their parents wish. Ms. Sentner operated a WhatsApp group called Knowledge is Key. Joining was optional, Ms. Sentner said, on which she shared anti-vax material with teachers. When a parent asked if the school would mandate the flu vaccine, Sentner laid out her skepticism about vaccines in a letter to parents. I thought she was okay with approved ones, but I guess not. She cited a nonprofit organization started by, oh boy, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., an anti-vaccination crusader, as many of you have learned by now, we are not blind followers. We, are, we try not to make fear-based decisions, she wrote. In November, two grade levels in the preschool added two days of online-only instruction to their long Thanksgiving break after several COVID-19 cases were confirmed. Once Florida began administrating, or administering the coronavirus vaccines, Sentner invited members of the school community to a virtual talk with an anti-vaccination pediatrician. Why wouldn't they have that in person? To discuss potential dangers of the vaccines, Kennedy visited the school and met with teachers. So did another anti-vax activist who also met with students. Then came the announcement that vaccinated teachers would have to stay away from students or would not be allowed to return for now if they get the vaccine over the summer. If you want to get it, this is not going to be the right school for you, Sentner told teachers about the vaccine on a virtual call. There's a picture now in the New York Times coverage of the school building itself. And quite honestly, it looks like either a video arcade or maybe a uh, uh, soft serve ice cream stand that you might find on a boardwalk someplace. But that's Miami for you. Nobody spoke up with concerns, said Jimena Hills, a faculty member who supports Ms. Sentner and said she had no problem with the school's policies on vaccinations and thought they should not have been leaked to the news media. All of this controversy could really have been avoided by hiding, you see. All right. Is there more that I think is particularly interesting? I mean, I think it's kind of uh, speaks for itself at this point. I'll skip down to here and say, uh, oh, I guess the local state senator, Jason W.B. Pizzo, P-I-Z-Z-O, a Democrat, said he was told that neither the Department of Education nor the Department of Health had jurisdiction over the school's vaccination policies. Sentner Academy had one student receiving a public voucher this school year. On Thursday, Mr. Pizzo introduced a legislative amendment that he hoped would prevent schools and businesses from prohibiting people from getting vaccinated, calling such a policy quackery. He's had some bipartisan support. Oh, well, that does it. Then. Bipartisan support. Let's show that the Senate is not insane, said State Senator Jeff Brandes of St. Petersburg, a Republican. It failed on a tied vote. So on the question of whether or not the Florida State Senate is insane, the answer is it is. The vote failed, and they are about 50% insane. Um, all right, well, let's see. By the way, just to finish things up here, back in Miami, Ms. Sentner appeared unbothered. On Friday, she posted on Instagram that she would speak next month at a freedom-fighting festival. That's interesting. 
uh, fighting freedom, I guess, with several conservative political luminaries, including Michael Flynn, the notorious spy, and Roger Stone, the notorious pervert spy. Its theme, reopen America. Arrest them all, I say. And I would be wrong and acting baselessly, and they would have the charges against them dismissed. But what can I tell you? Uh, still want it to happen. Okay, thanks for the tip, that guy. That's true. So now that's going on. And uh, uh, and if you want to work there, there's a, not an opening for the wacko CEO. I guess now that we have read the article, we get uh, a lot better sense of just what a whack job the CEO is, and now I understand why she's so interested in confidentiality. And then you do too. All right. Thanks. That was uh, unexpected. Let's see. Jumping back to, uh, uh, we'll make a theme of it. Teachers, in, wacko teachers in particular, not necessarily in wacko schools, but uh, wackos nonetheless. This story, who shared this one with me? Did I keep the the tweet from it. Let me see what else is in pocket next to it. Sometimes I, I keep the source of the story or who pointed me to it. No, I guess I haven't. Um, I'll see if I can think of who might have done it. But I, I'm sure that it was probably one of you sent a a tip in uh, maybe the KITM hashtag to this story from the Kansas City Star about another wacko teacher, Kansas Representative Mark Samsel, arrested for battery after a physical altercation with student because Kansas Representative Mark Samsel is uh, not only, a, a, obviously, a Republican elected official, because who else would be involved in something like this but a Republican? But uh, I guess uh, the daytime gig is substitute teaching. Kansas State Representative Mark Samsel, it's M S A M S E L. Arrested on charges of alleged misdemeanor battery on Thursday. What's the date of this article? April 30th, so a little ways back. But arrested on Thursday after getting into a physical altercation with a student while substitute teaching in Wellsville. Samsel, 36, was booked into the Franklin County Adult Detention Center after 3.30 p.m. on Thursday. He's since been released on a $1,000 bond. It's not much. Sheriff Jeff Richards said... Superintendent Ryan Bradbury said that Samsel will no longer be allowed to work for the district, but he still gets to be a state representative, I guess. On Wednesday, Samsel was substitute teaching at the Wellsville School District's secondary school. Throughout the day, high school students began recording videos of the lawmaker talking about suicide, sex, masturbation, God, and the Bible. And I don't know if those are all separate topics that he ranged into or one overarching theme that he had for the day. But apparently so odd and so alarming to the students that they all took out phones and started recording video. I mean, he's obviously mentally unbalanced, I would say. In one video shared with the star, Samsel tells students about a sophomore who's tried killing himself three times, adding that it was because he has two parents... And they're both females. Oh, boy. He's a foster kid. I'm sure this is all true, too. He didn't make any of it up. He's a foster kid. His alternatives in life were having no parents or foster care parents who are gay. Oh, my God. That probably deserves some dramatic music. <laughs> Samsel tells these students, how do you think I'm going to feel if he commits suicide? Awful. Well, I mean... Everybody would feel awful if a kid commits suicide, but why you in particular? I don't know. Because uh, he's crazy. In another video, Samsel was recorded telling students, make babies. Who likes making babies? That feels good, doesn't it? Well, this, this guy really needs to be arrested. Uh, procreate. You haven't masturbated? Don't answer that question. God already knows. What? Okay. Video shared with the star by parents of students in the class shows Samsel focusing most of his attention on one male student. I think that guy feels pretty uncomfortable. Both Samsel and the student paced around the classroom, talking back and forth. Samsel is shown following the student around and grabbing him. In one video, he puts his arms around the student and says that he was being hard on him. I don't know how to take that. At one point, Samsel tells the student, you're about ready to anger me and get the wrath of God. 
Do you believe me when I tell you that God has been speaking to me? He then pushes him, and the student runs to the other side of the classroom, which is exactly what you should do. And in fact, he says that. You should run and scream. Well, yeah, and you should get the net. Holy mackerel. Hi, it's me, David Goldman, your host for K-Girl in the Morning. I have good news to report. Many more listeners like you are making critical contributions that keep our show on the air. Makes good sense, of course, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple. Now you can make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for helping keep you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all of your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the K-Go in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I'm still thumbing through the uh, KITM hashtag, hoping to see if I can identify who sent the story along so I can properly credit you for it. But uh, I don't know. Uh, could be further back in the thread or in the scroll than I thought, or it could just be that I found it in general Twitter elsewhere at some other point. But uh, <clears throat> all right. Well, you'll just have to silently enjoy credit for it. If uh, you're the one that passed this story along and it gets super crazy, it, it actually gets worse than this. And I think now I recall that wherever I picked this thing up from, they were saying this story just gets worse and worse as it goes on. You can't believe the levels of crazy that this guy is is getting to. And I guess we ought to keep an eye on. Is he is he? Uh, yeah, Kansas, the Kansas state legislature to see whether at any point anybody brings up the possibility of expelling this guy. From the, I guess he's got to be convicted of this stuff first, but all right, we left off where he had, uh, I guess, been uh, arguing with this student and that they're pacing around the room looking at each other, uh, but arguing over the weird stuff that Samsel is, is telling these kids and getting you know more and more uh, weird and, and sexual in nature as it goes on, and then he runs over and grabs the student and says, you're about to... You're about ready to anger me. I think that probably had already happened. And get the wrath of God. And then do you believe me when I tell you that God has been speaking to me? That's the point at which you should be taking off. And he does. And he says to him, you should run and scream. Now check this out. It's going to get worse. I, 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 just, I just said it would. But he, I don't know how else to describe this. I've read ahead. So I have that advantage. In another video, he tells students, and this, this is the quote, I guess. Class, you have permission to kick him in the balls. That's He actually says this about this kid that he's just been arguing with and grabbing. Parents told the star that Samsel, quote, put hands on the student. That's a gentle way of describing things, I think. And allegedly, kneed him in the crotch. He did it. He actually went and did it. He put hands on, they put hands on the student. Yeah, well, more importantly, he put a knee on the student and in, in his, yeah, in the crotch. I mean, What? In a video apparently taken immediately after the incident, I guess nobody caught that one, the student is shown on the ground, as you might expect. Samsel is standing over him and says, did it hurt? Which I think he was probably teasing the guy, but I mean, obviously it did hurt. Then he asks him why he is about to start crying, pats him on the shoulder and apologizes, and then says he can go to the nurse. She can check it for you. Samsel addresses another student and says, do you want to check his nuts for him, please? Like, at that point, kids pull out the pens and stab the teacher right there in the classroom. Uh, You can even video it. You're in trouble. You're in danger, girl. Get the police. The videos angered dozens of parents, yes, who felt that their children were put in danger. They were. One of them was kneed in the crotch. Samsel works with students in several capacities, to which I would now in Wellville say, no, he doesn't. He may used to have worked with kids in several capacities, but he'll be working in the uh, working as a janitor in prison 
from now on. Uh, but he works with students in several capacities, including as a referee and through church groups, parents said. Of course he does. Seize that computer. Let's see what's on it. Oh, my God. I'm, con- I'm a concerned parent who doesn't want this swept under the rug, I hope so, said Father Joshua Zek, not Father Joshua. He's not a priest. He's a father of a student. Uh, he's around kids all the time. Really, ever would be a problem. He's a state representative. Don't lose sight of that. He's in a position of power. Zek said that he felt Samsel was bullying the student. You think? In a message to families, Bradbury, I guess that's the school administrator, said the situation is being investigated. Student safety has and always will be our first priority, he said. Samsel is the second Kansas lawmaker to be arrested this year, by the way. Former Senate Majority Leader Gene Suellentrop, I remember that, a Wichita Republican was charged with felony eluding and fleeing from police and also faces misdemeanor charges of drunk and reckless driving after allegedly driving the wrong way on Topeka highways in March of this year, March 16th. He was forced to step down from his leadership post. On Twitter, Kansas City Mayor Quentin Lucas posted, what the hell is going on with the Kansas legislature this session? He added that Samsel shouldn't just be terminated from substituting, he should be blocked from being around all kids. The district reported the incident, and an investigation was conducted by the Wellsville Police Department and Franklin County Sheriff's Office. After the investigation, Samsel was arrested for misdemeanor battery. Misdemeanor battery, really? According to a news release, he, he, as a substitute teacher, need a student in the crotch. I don't know why that's misdemeanor battery. In a snapshot, oh, sorry, in a Snapchat post shared with the Star, Samsel wrote that it was all planned. Hmm. Every little bit of it. That's right. The kids and I planned all this to send a message about art, mental health, teenage suicide, how we treat our educators and one another. To who? The parents and grandparents and all of Wellsville, he posted. He wrote that he gave one particular student hope. I went to jail for battery. Does that really make me a criminal? Time will tell. (laughs) Time has told me. I went to jail for battery. Does that make me a criminal? Yes, you're a convict. You've been in I mean, people can be wrongly imprisoned, obviously, but you were caught on video perpetrating this crime and you went to jail for it. Does that make me a criminal? Yes, it does. Did you have a follow up or was that the end of your question? Uh, He said that the incident happened during fifth period. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that it happened during fifth period and that the class... Before that hour, oh, the classes before that hour went as planned, and he shared the same lesson with each one. He said what happened was exactly what God planned. The kids were in on it, not all of them, but most. So I guess the sort of the gym traffic and defense. This was a sting operation, you see. This was uh, all the kids are, uh, the kid I need in the crotch was a crisis actor. Parents told the star that their children were upset by what took place that day. He's a leader, he's in the state house, he's somebody in a position of power, and he did not do right by those kids, Zach said. That was putting it mildly. A lot of the kids were affected by that. I'm surprised that there's no comments here, but maybe it's wiser not to make these comments to the newspaper. Like, I'll tear the throat out of his neck, the mf -er. that kid need in the, I'll, you know, who knows? People should be, again, throwing them off cliffs. I'm surprised that there's nothing more like that in the paper. Jessica Roberts, a mother with two children who attended the school, said that she is now more concerned about Samsel's involvement in youth sports and activities. True, they should probably turn their attention there. I think he shouldn't be around children, she said. I, by the way, I think he shouldn't be around the legislature. I think they should throw him out. And I guess he's already convicted. He's served jail time for it. What I hope he's not still a member of the legislature. Maybe they're at a session, but, you know, whatever. Have a special session. Chuck him out. Maybe his term's over. In another video, Samsel is shown telling the student about distractions from the devil and then grabs him from behind and lifts him off his feet. I mean, that's enough to send you to jail, in my view. In a different clip, he tells the student to go to the office. You are not following, not my rules, God's rules right now, he tells the student. You better take a Bible. 
Keep denying God. Keep denying God. See how it's going to turn out, he told the student. By the way, uh, how it turned out, uh, he went to jail. So, you know, we're not at the end game necessarily, but so far it's not working out very well for him. He is also shown on video instructing some students to go outside, hold hands, and run around the track seemingly as punishment. Hmm. Do you think we want to do this? No, we had a lesson to do. Is it kind of funny? Yeah. Are they ever going to learn? God only knows, he said while watching the two students run outside. I mean, most of the class is spent by the kids videoing the lunatic teacher. So I don't know how, I don't know how uh, class periods one through four went, but I'd be surprised if it was really the same and there was no video of it. Video shows Samsel's classrooms in chaos as he talks about the devil, God, and how the Bible was edited. I mean, uh, this guy's best hope at this point is to say that he was in a, you know, uh, in a, in, in diabetic shock and having a medical event. Uh, but I don't know. It hasn't occurred to him yet. Are you doing the Lord's work as you're listening to the devil's music? He asked the student. And he continually references suicide and tells the class, I'm not going to lose one more of my kids to suicide. Are we clear? Uh, yeah, I think the bigger danger is them killing you, though, sir. House Speaker Ron Rickman, finally, some word from them, let's see, told the star that we're not yet, we we're not yet aware of the details and in the process of gathering as much information as we can. The dude is in jail. I mean, what are you going to do? Samsel, who is an attorney is in his second term in the House, where he's occasionally courted controversy. Surprise. In February, he was one of just 13 lawmakers to vote against a bill that would have ended an exemption for spouses from their state's sexual battery law. That sounds pretty archaic and ancient, and he voted against it. Ahead of the vote, he gave a speech in which he appeared to express concerns about criminalizing sexual relations between spouses. To me... It gets to, what does the sanctity of marriage mean? Samsel was quoted as saying, according to the Kansas Reflector, and I'm single. Oh, <laughs> that is a huge surprise. I'm single, so I'm not the best person to speak to this, but when you do get married, what does that mean? And what implied consent are you giving? Oh, boy. More recently, Samsel raised the possibility of impeaching Suellentrop. <laughs> he's he's anti-crime, this guy. He's tough on crime. But the state constitution doesn't allow that impeachment or the impeachment of legislators, as does the federal constitution, uh, or rather, same but with the federal constitution. If we're going to be in a leadership position, who's most important that's watching us? To me, this is interesting, it's the kids, Samsel <laughs> told the star, recently when discussing the Sue Ellen Trop case. For the kids, we got to throw Sue Ellen Trop out. Wow. And when they look across our country right now and see that you can do things under bathroom stalls or whatever else, make up an excuse, deny immediately, and then it turns out, yeah, you were kind of guilty, which is, of course, exactly what he's doing. The process happens way too many times, and it's not been done the right way. So there's your answer. Get that effing guy out of the legislature and into prison. And uh, there's some links here so you can see some of the videos, which is pretty scary all by itself. And then some of the other things. So related stories from the Kansas City Star are that one. And then this is an interesting selection of related stories. Next related story is Republican Chris Kobach seeking comeback launches campaign for Kansas attorney general. I don't know if we made a note of that or not, but it's true. And he appears to be attempting to do that. And somehow they think that's a related story. So that's interesting all by itself. Um, then again, the uh, comeback story. Uh, what else do they have here with state with Senate Medicaid vote, Missouri GOP puts governor Mike Parson in political bind. I guess they're basically just talking Republican politics as related stories here. Okay. Well, these guys are nuts and perverts, and they ought to get rid of them. Is there an updated story on this guy? I'm just curious. Uh, we'll do this research live here. I'm going to Google Mark Samsel and uh, see if there's like an updated. I mean, it's only been a couple of weeks. It's like the end of the uh, of April that this story is from. Yeah, uh, semi-creepy looking dude, but not terribly creepy looking, I, I must say. Um, he could pass as a possible normal person. But uh, 
let's see. After arrest, Kansas Representative Mark Samsel loses seat on, not in the legislature, but loses seat on Alma Mater's Board of Trustees. <laughs> He's not that trusty, I, I would say. Uh, and one of the videos is embedded here, too. Hmm, pretty amazing. Let's see. He lost a seat on the Missouri Valley College Board of Trustees following his arrest after he was alleged to have need a student in the crotch. And then told all the other kids in the class to do the thing. I would kick them off the board of trustees too. So board of trustees, uh, quicker and more responsive than the Kansas state legislature at this point. So that's kind of weird. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Yeah. Maybe nothing about him. But he's on Twitter if you want to follow him. M. Samsil KC. Just in case you were interested in following along. What's his latest tweets? He's there uh, pictured as in his referee outfit, hanging out with some basketball players. He's a basketball ref. Uh, his latest is 11 hours ago, or a retweet of someone else's comment 11 hours ago. Who's he uh, following here? Uh, Associated Press correspondent for uh, Topeka, John Hanna. So just, uh, I don't know, basic news. You know, It's not like he's wandering around saying, yeah, I need everybody in the crotch. What about it? So let's see. Uh, he seems to be excited about the consideration of uh, medical marijuana legislation. So I guess he's not only still there, he's getting ready to vote and still casting those votes. And uh, why they allow him in the building, I have no idea. Um, oh, and uh, he has also retweeted recently Adam Kinzinger's tweet a must-read letter from Officer Michael Fanon to Congress on his first-hand experience protecting the Capitol complex on January 6, 2021. How interesting. Is he like a supporter of the anti-Trump forces? I would not have guessed that about him. And the rest of the tweets for now seem to be about uh, baseball results. Oh, let's see. Here's a retweet of uh, someone else, Heath Mayo who says, hey, followers, apologies for filling your feed with a steady stream of pro Liz Cheney content, but this is a crucial battle over our shared principles in the future of the country. This is amazing. It tests whether we'll defend leaders who tell the truth or surrender to the mob. I'm all in. Mark Samsel retweets this. What a complicated individual this is. If you, I mean, I would have guessed, if you had told me, would you believe he's a huge Trump supporter? I'd say, yeah, sure. Would you believe he's a Liz Cheney supporter and an anti-Trumper? No. And, but uh, if, if you just, on, on the other hand, I guess say, wow, what kind of trouble is the Republican Party in? Because the people who are rallying to the side of Liz Cheney in her fight with the lunatics in the side, the Republican Party are themselves lunatics, but for completely different reasons and in completely different ways. That party, I don't know what to tell you, chuck it off a cliff, the whole thing. Uh, I don't know. Greg keeps telling me there are normal Republicans out there. And, you know, I start off down the path. I guess if I didn't really go this way, but if I then went down the path and said, all right, normal Republicans, let me see if I can seek them out here. I'll start by looking in the in the quarters where they're tweeting support for Liz Cheney. Oh, OK. He supports Liz Cheney, but he's kneeing students in the crotch and telling other students, kick them in the balls. And do you believe me when I tell you God talks to me? Hmm. Well, I got to check that one off the list. That's a narrower subsample that I was looking at than I thought when I'm looking around for normal Republicans remaining in the party. OK, that's pretty crazy. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Anyway, uh, yes, I didn't mention this before, but I uh, I uh, uh, noted here Chris Kobach has, in fact, uh, filed paperwork to run for the attorney general slot in Kansas. That, according to The Hill, from uh, when? April 29th. So it's been a little while now that that's been the case. I mean, I'm not following every move by Chris Kobach, and I don't know what his chances are there, but hopefully... Uh, well, you hope that Kansas is sensible enough to keep him out of office, but mm, look who else is in office there in Kansas. So they definitely have some problems. We'll see how they deal with these things. Um, a couple of other items 
they've been lingering around for a little while. Any of them that uh, lend themselves particularly to a good Friday afternoon discussion? I will not see. Got uh, that one I'll save for a different day. How about this one? This I think I was thinking of including in the big lie discussions. And since we've spent so much time on that this week, we might as well try and squeeze this in. I don't know that we can fit the whole thing in even with 10 minutes left here. But uh, let's take a look. This uh, a a New York Times piece. Um, am I starting at the top here? Oh, it's one of those weird interactive things, so it's difficult. The layout is funny. Uh, and it runs under the title of The Slander Industry. Again, in the New York Times. And, uh, well, are we... We've got the right person here, Aaron Krolik. But the uh, the pocket view of things also lists Kashmir Hill along with Aaron Krolik. But I think Krolik is, well, he's definitely part of it because you see him in some of these included uh, screen grabs here. So here's how the piece begins, the slander industry. I wanted to slander someone. My colleague... Kashmir Hill and I, so now we know they're both on this one, we're trying to learn who is responsible for and profiting from the growing ecosystem of websites whose primary purpose is destroying reputations. So I wrote a nasty post about myself. Just to guess, test the system. Why can't I, can I use this to get rid of Mark Samsel by any chance? Or any of the other nuts we've read about today? And here is a, <clears throat> a picture of the nasty post that he wrote about himself. He titles it, Aaron Krolik, New York, is an unqualified loser. <laughs> uh, okay. And then posts it on where? Uh, Bad Girl Reports dot what? Dot date is what it looks like. I don't really know what this is about, but he uses this website to post this thing about it. Then he says, we watched as a constellation of sites duplicated my creation. So I guess bots are programmed to grab the content from either this site in particular or sites like it and repost it all over the place, sometimes changing the the titles just a little bit. But uh, yeah, uh, all sorts of things now proliferating, saying Aaron Krolik is an absolute loser. To get slander removed, many people hire a reputation management company. In my case, it was going to cost roughly $20,000. I feel like this piece really jumps in in the middle of this narrative somehow, but this is how it offers it up. It's very weird. Um, the interactive features on this. All right. Let's see. To get the slander removed, you could pay up to upwards of twenty thousand dollars. We soon discovered a secret hidden, uh, a secret hidden behind a smokescreen of fake companies and false identities. The people facilitating slander and the self-proclaimed good guys who help remove it are often one and the same. This is all, I guess. Now I understand the layout of this piece, all by way of introduction to the big piece here: Aaron Krolik and Kashmir Hill, the slander industry. April 24th, 2021, begins here. The uh, confusing and unfathomable mess that appears ahead of it is the New York Times idea of being interactive online and, you know, content and visual rich. Uh, but it's actually quite annoying and distracting and, and doesn't help much. That's my critique of your work there today, New York Times. The slander industry. Part one, the stain. At first glance, the websites appear amateurish. They definitely do. They have names like badgirlreports.date, bustedcheaters.com, and worsthomewrecker.com. A very particular kind of slander, I guess, they must be interested in. Photos are badly cropped. Grammar and spelling are afterthoughts. They're clunky and text-heavy, as if they're intended to be read by machines, not humans. Aha. Uh -huh. Now you're onto something. But do not underestimate their power. When someone attacks you on these so-called gripe sites, the results can be devastating. Earlier this year, we wrote about a woman in Toronto who poisoned the reputations of dozens of her perceived enemies by posting lies about them. Uh, that piece, also in the New York Times, A Vast Web of Vengeance, 
it's called. Outrageous Lies destroyed Guy Babcock's online reputation. And when he went hunting for their source, what he discovered was worse than he could have imagined. That's their previous article on the subject. To assess the slander's impact, we wrote a software program to download every post from a dozen of the most active complaint sites. More than 150,000 posts, about some 47,000 people. Then we set up a web crawler that searched Google and Bing for thousands of the people who had been attacked. For about one third of the people, the nasty posts appeared on the first pages of their results. For more than half, the gripe sites showed up at the top of their image results. These were the Google image results for Aaron Krolik, NYC. And, uh, you know, there are several, but up on the top, not the first ones offered, but in the first row of image results are these, uh, the image that they used in their fake slander post. So you can see how quickly it gets up at the top of the sites. And I guess with so many people uh, being forced to submit uh, social media profiles or being Googled by HR departments when they're applying for jobs, you can see where it would get in the way of your life. Sometimes, the article continues, search engines go a step further than simply listing links. They display what they consider the most relevant phrases about whatever you're searching for. One woman in Ohio was the subject of so many negative posts that Bing declared in bold at the top of her search results that she, quote, is a liar and a cheater, the same way that it states that Barack Obama was the 44th president of the United States. For roughly 500 of the 6,000 people we searched for, Google suggested adding the phrase cheater to a search of their names. The unverified claims are on obscure, ridiculous-looking websites, but search engines give them a veneer of credibility. Well, that's a little bit like uh, giving the veneer of credibility to people who lie about the, the big lie, the big election lie, by either debating it with them calmly or allowing it on Fox News in suits and ties or what have you. Or having uh, elected elites say, you're right to me, ask these questions. Always about the veneer of credibility. Posts from cheaterboard.com appear in Google results alongside Facebook pages and LinkedIn profiles, or in my case, articles in the New York Times. That would be bad enough for people whose reputations have been savaged, but the problem is all the worse because it's so hard to fix. And that is largely because of the secret symbiotic relationship between those facilitating slander and those getting paid to remove it. That's the interesting part here. And of course, we're just about out of time, but I thought I'd give you a taste of this article. Maybe something you want to check out over the weekend. Uh, just a little bit more before we exit for the day. Section two, the spread. The posts I created featured an awkward selfie and described me as a loser who will do anything for attention. Probably shouldn't have done this. We posted a version of the same insult on five gripe sites. Each selfie included a unique watermark that allowed us to track it as it showed up somewhere new. That's a good idea. For an image posted to cheaterboard.com, for example, we hid the domain name and the date in the file code. The posts spread quickly. Inside of two hours, the cheaterboard one had popped up on foulspeakers.com. Within a month, the original five posts had spawned 21 copies on 15 sites. What was the point of copying these posts? It does happen a lot. A big clue were the ads that appeared next to them, offering help removing reputation tarnishing content now you see what's going on here the post on foulspeakers.com featured this ad for reputation management we contacted all of the sites that copied the original posts only two responded and only one person consented to an interview cyrus sullivan who runs foulspeakers.com so he gets the most prominent play here uh very interesting so mr sullivan 37 of portland oregon has been in the complaint site business since 2008 when he started, this is nice, stdcarriers.com. It was inspired by his own experience in his senior year at the University of Oregon. He said he had sex with a woman who belatedly told him that she had herpes. I thought, there needs to be a way to warn people about something like that. And maybe this wasn't the way to do it, but that's the way he decided to go. All right, I think I see the pattern developing here. The long story short, I think you'll find in all of this is 
it would be an excellent way to raise money from a bunch of suckers if you both established both uh, a network of complaint sites where you invited people to post slanders like this, then copied it from itself, your own sites, to other sites that you own all over the internet, and then offer people who Google themselves and find these attacks the opportunity to remove them all. And uh, they may have tried to remove them themselves or use some other service to do it, but it works a lot better if you are actually both the person petitioning for removal and the site hosting the actual attack. No wonder you can charge $20,000. You're extraordinarily effective in removing it from the internet. Weird. What a scam. NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to K Grow in the Morning with David Waldman. Well, one of those scams rose to become one of the uh, major political parties in the United States, so that's a pretty good uh, record for them. Anyway, that's it for the weekend for us. We wrap it up now and hand it off to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Uh, I imagine many more scams to be revealed on his program coming up next.